How's it going, everyone? Welcome back to Titled Gardens. This is another episode of Reef Receipts. I've got Brandy here. And in this series, we take a look at some scientific articles. Sometimes they apply really well to this to this hobby because there's sometimes there's like some curiosities that we have, and it turns out that the scientific community has already worked it out well in advance for us. And oftentimes we don't get into the habit of reading scientific journals. So we're just kind of ignorant of it. Other times, not a great fit, but we take a look at all the ones that we can regardless. So anyways, thanks so much for joining me again, Brandy. And what are we taking a look at today? So this one I'm actually super, super excited about. I think it's really cool. Um, It's something that I think we kind of talk about in the hobby, um, coral boundary layers. They're microbial life that live around the coral. So bacteria stuff, basically. Bacteria, um, viruses, funguses, all the little critters we can't see. Oh, okay. So um, this particular article is entitled, The Coral Ecosphere, a Unique Coral Reef Habitat that Fosters Coral Microbial Interactions. Their question essentially is, um, do corals create and manage their own microbial communities in their boundary layers? So there's two aspects of that that I thought was really cool, and it's the fact that they're creating and managing their microbial community, not just that it happens to be there, um, but that it's happening in their boundary layer also. So what is a boundary layer? So that's like that area right around a coral where the water flow kind of gets diminished, so the water's not really moving. Mm -hmm. Um, It's like fluid dynamics type stuff, and it's different for each coral. Like the shape of the coral is kind of going to influence how big or small that boundary layer is of non-moving water. Yeah, I typically would see that in something like a colony of bird's nest, for example, where like the branches get like really tight, and then eventually like the inside branches get kind of suffocated out, and so you kind of get this growth layer of of branches towards like the outer part, but the inner part kind of gets faded and just dies off and just becomes more, I guess, reef substrate, I suppose. And it's like where it's not getting enough flow. Yeah, no, 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 not enough flow, not not enough light. Mm -hmm. Okay, so the boundary layer is just in that, that entire area of slow flow. What they found out was that that boundary layer is so ecologically diverse that it's essentially its own ecosystem. So, The bacteria and the pathogens, everything you find in that little tiny, like, zero to five centimeter space right around a coral has such a unique um, micro profile that it can be considered an ecosystem in and of itself. Hmm. Okay. So it's it's different than just, like, the, the water column in general. It's really doing its own thing, and they're looking to see how the corals are going about managing that or if they are at all yeah so like the fact that that was even its own um ecosystem was part of what they were trying to uncover so this is something that's kind of been hypothesized i think we talk about this a little bit in the hobby also nobody had really proven this before like shown this was the case i'll get to how they did it in a little bit but it's they it's very logical but also kind of out of the box thinking they found that the corals control their microbial communities. So like, it's not just that what's living there um, happened to show up there. The corals are actively doing things to um, kind of like farm the bacteria and mm-hmm. funguses and viruses. Yeah, I guess I, I hear two things when it comes to bacteria. I hear that corals consume a lot of bacteria for nutrition, but also bacteria is one of the chief drivers of coral infections and die off. So yeah, it is kind of interesting to to hear about how those types of things are regulated right at the coral. So that that's actually one of the things that they found out too, is that it seems like coral symbionts, like the ones that are beneficial to the coral, there it are times where things switch, like maybe the water's too warm and that bacteria is like, I don't like you, Coral. I'm not going to help you anymore. You're not helping me. And start attacking the Coral because that's what's better for the bacteria because the bacteria is all about themselves, right? They're only going to work with the Coral when it's beneficial to their own species. Mm -hmm. But they can very quickly turn around and start attacking the Coral. Huh. Okay. 
Interesting. So they also found that the microbes are um, responding to the coral. So the genes that are being expressed by the viruses, the fungus, whatever it is, changes based on what hormones the corals are putting out into that little layer. Okay. So that's an awful lot of stuff. <laughs> so how do, how do you go about even showing something like that? Their procedures were really, really good, actually. So the first thing that they did was they went out and they collected the water. Obviously, you got to have the water. But they did this by taking sterile syringes, like one milliliter syringes, and collecting water right around the coral. They also, as a control, checked in other areas and different volumes. It has to be a really small amount because otherwise you collect so much microbe life. And this is all in the ocean? Yes, all in the ocean. Not okay. happening in tanks. So they would take like a little like one ml syringe, stick it inside a the colony, layer. Yeah. take a sample. Back it out a few centimeters. Take another sample of it with with a different, different syringe. syringe. Yep. And then a, a third syringe, a fourth syringe, to get like a gradient going from like the inside, all the way out mm -hmm. to basically open ocean. Yeah, to about two meters out, I think was where they. Okay, stopped. so it's about six feet. Yeah, they found that they couldn't do bigger samples because there was so much microbial life, like it just became noise. Mm -hmm. So this has been done before, but with like. The volume that they were looking at was liters, not one milliliter. Okay. So there was just there was just too much information to make sense of when they were doing such a huge volume. Because they Has, found everything in it. They found everything. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So you can't really make a decision when you have all the things. You have to have like some narrowing down of the data. Then their genetic sequencing was super involved. They actually were so thorough that they found new bacterial species, hmm. which I think is really cool. The DNA is locked up inside the cells, like there's the cell is a bag, and you have to do something to break those cells open. But cells are made of different things, so some things are easier to break than others. So they actually used multiple techniques to break the cells open so that they could get all the DNA out. Then they took all of that DNA and went through, I think there's five pages of them explaining all the DNA databases they went through to make sure that they were identifying all the different bacteria that existed. And not just bacteria. I keep saying just bacteria, but it's funguses, viruses, protists, archaea, all kinds of stuff that they were looking at. Very, very thorough, very, very time consuming, and very, very expensive. But how do you make that leap from getting, okay, so great, we matched DNA to a certain strain of bacteria. But that doesn't explain to me like the interaction of like the corals doing anything to the bacteria and vice versa. Yeah. So what they were looking at specifically is the gene sequences. So they can tell by where the proteins exist on the gene sequences, whether or not certain genes are active or not. Okay. And so there's certain genes such as they call them quorum sensing, which means like the bacteria can tell how many bacteria are around them. Um, those only exist if the bacteria is on a surface, so like on a tissue surface. Those active proteins, those active genome sections changed along that gradient. So as they were closer to the coral, there were more genes active that were involved in metabolism of things that the coral needed. Like let's say coral needs aluminum and um, the corals already used all the aluminum. So it's been transferred to a form that's not bioreactive. The bacteria has certain genes that are turned on that can take that aluminum from the locked up form to a form that the coral can use again. And so the coral is actually doing things like there's hormones from the coral in, the, in that water gradient that was telling the bacteria, hey, switch on this gene so that I can get more aluminum. That's interesting. And kind of like going back to the quorum sensing thing, I guess that kind of has this, uh, an analogous thing in like a fast growing coral colony, like a Favites, for example. You get like a small, you know, frag plug of Favites. The inside of the Favites doesn't grow as fast as the outside. Like the outside rim is a thing that's like taking off with growth. So there's like regulation on the inside of that colony that says, don't go crazy here. There's mm -hmm. no space. So, so bacteria, once it hits surfaces, it does that as well. And so yeah. because they can tell by genetic sequencing that those things, those markers were active. That means that there was some sort of activity going on. 
Okay. That's a little bit a little bit more murky when it comes to like the coral interaction part, but the other thing with like telling it to go get me aluminum, that's a that's a bigger deal. Mm-hmm. And they did how many types of these? They did five different coral. They collected a lot of samples. I don't remember off the top of my head. They actually threw out um, some of their samples because they had collected so much data that they realized it just wasn't reasonable to do anything with some of it. So like they had tested big samples also, like in the like, two liter samples, just to compare. And they're like, we can't do anything with this. It's too much. Okay. And where, where was this all? All in um, just south of Cuba. So it's actually these two spots are one of the most protected areas of the Caribbean, of the world, um, of reef sites that you can find. So it's very hard to get permits to get in here to do any research either. Mm -hmm. So they had to be like very thorough and detail everything that they were doing to, so that they could get in here and do this. So they're looking at like these Caribbean species. So it's also species that we don't really see in the hobby that much. Yeah. I think that we, we did take a look at some of them and I, I, I had literally not heard of like half of them. So they got this really cool graphic from all this data. So like reading through this paper is a lot because they're talking about all the digesting enzymes they're doing, all the different techniques they used for sequencing the DNA. It's it's a lot of big words and can get very confusing. But at the end, they did this really cool graphic that showed what they called the interaction zone between um, reef water, the coral, and then that in between that boundary layer and showed how there's this difference in that ecosphere, like right around the coral. One, the bacteria, all the microbial life, there's exfold more of it in that area. Also, they're doing different things. So they found some of those things outside of the coral area. Of course, you're going to find the same bacterias, but the gene sequences are turned on in a different kind of way. Hmm. So one of the main species that I kind of feel like we should be talking about a bacteria that's a symbiotic bacteria, kind of like zoanthelia is symbiotic to the coral, is called endosoicomus. Mm -hmm. And they almost operate like gut bacteria for the coral. Mm -hmm. And they found it in every coral across the world. And it's like this microbe that's laying, living right there at the surface of the coral. Um, and it's helping with all that hormone regulation. So those bacteria are doing like the recruiting of other bacteria. Like the coral needs more food. We're going to go farm whatever bacteria. So a lot of times when we think of bacteria, we think that they have to outcompete each other. But this particular bacteria is actually like a growth enhancer of other bacteria. So when you grow it with... It's middle management. Yeah. <laughs> so when you grow it with bacteria, like there, it's actually causing an increase in growth. So different kind of perspective of how we look at bacteria. Yeah, because again, I, I always look at bacteria through the lens of like infection. But I mean, if you look at just like the human body, I think that there's like that anecdote about how if you like just count up the number of cells in your body, like more than half of them are actually bacteria and not you. Yeah, you're not you. You're bacteria. Yeah, you're mostly bacteria. (laughs) Whatever you thought you were, what you really are is bacteria. And I know that like gut bacteria just it regulates like some kind of like brain function and things of that sort. So it would make sense that this sort of thing happens also, you know, at the coral level. And uh, it's it's so poorly understood, I think, that, yeah, it's it's interesting that they even showed that, like, yeah, the, the corals are actively farming. They, they grow in certain ways to maximize the efficiency of bacterial strains and everything like that in and around them. And the thing that I find so mind-blowing is we wouldn't have seen this if they hadn't decided to look at small amounts of seawater like we always talk about how the ocean is vast but Mm -hmm. this is happening in like micro within five centimeters of the coral surface right like yeah they they did talk about some things that could have messed up their study a little bit um the sample sizes they weren't super happy about that by the end anybody doing this in the future use small samples just use one milliliter syringes you don't need Mm -hmm. bigger syringes um, and at some point they had run out of dive time. Um, and so they all had to come back to the boat. And so they had p- 
put down a submersible pump to get some of the bigger sample sizes that they were collecting. They're like, maybe the pump like killed some of the bacteria. They're like, I don't think it did. But they put it in as a possible um, issue because they didn't they didn't get any usable data from that anyway. So now that kind of makes me think about like our home aquariums, because I know that some folks are sending off samples to get tested at a lab. And it just occurred to me, like, if you're taking uh, like a water sample just from your your tank generally, and I, I suppose it depends on the size of your tank. If you have like a small nano tank, you might get more results consistent to what they're they're seeing here. But I, if I just take a scoop out of my sump, for example, that's 500 gallons. There's no coral anywhere near that thing, and you know the the piping can go 30 feet to, you know, my SPS tank. Uh, yeah, it's according to this. I would get a wildly different bacterial profile just based on the location of my sample collection. Where if I was really worried about a specific, like Acropora, for example, mm -hmm. it's like I'm getting some some wonky. You know, I should probably take a look at that. Getting some weird disease thing going on. I should take a syringe and collect a sample from like inside that colony practically, because yeah. it's not going to exist outside that envelope. Yeah. Possibly. <laughs> I mean, so I just doubled, this was in 2019, and I double checked to make sure nobody was like, ah, oh, this was a terrible study. Mm -hmm. And it seems like this, everybody as of 2023 is still saying what this study said. That's like the gold standard. Yeah. Like this is, like we know that this is the case. Every time we've repeated this in those years since, it's mm -hmm. been four years, so how much repetition, but. It's like, this is interesting. We keep seeing this, that there's a difference right at the boundary layer of the coral versus the whole ocean. Yeah. And even two meters away, 60 centimeters away, they had a vast difference in what they saw. Yeah, it's very interesting. Uh, there's just so much about bacteria that like, I, I think that there's, there's going to be a lot more information about it that's going to be like very impactful for how we keep corals it'll be it'll be very curious to see where that comes from whether it be scientific journals or if it just comes from the industry itself there might be a lot of snake oil between now and then <laughs> uh, but i mean it's just like the little anecdotes just kind of come to mind things like in a protein skimmer most of your skimmate is bacteria things like that and it's like well that might not be great for your coral but you know according to this it's like actually it has no difference because the coral is doing its own thing with its own bacteria i mean that boundary layer is essentially the coral's immune system it's it's acting like an immune system it's acting like a hormone regulation center it's acting as a food regulation mm -hmm. um they're farming like it, it's almost feels like horton here's a who right <laughs> like like there's this whole like new life going on right there and um like vision like highways and stuff that don't really exist but it's it's the coral's doing stuff it's actively involved in what it needs and what it's getting yeah it's like we're farming corals here and then the corals are doing its own farming of sorts yeah, <laughs> yeah. it's like the yeah it's like the, the the more deep you look the box you know? inside the box inside the yeah. box <laughs> it's like a russian doll yeah. <laughs> of farming <laughs> Well, anyway, guys, uh, we will include a link to the article in uh, the description of the video. Hope you guys enjoy it. Uh, thanks again, Brandy. And we will see you all next time. Thanks.